My previous videos have been about openings. This one initiates a new type of video, hence allow me some words of introduction. There are many reasons for the popularity of chess. I depicted them in depth in the blog post 76 and 77 on my website. Here now a very very short version. Chess is so popular because it is a multidimensional phenomenon which caters to all kinds of different people with different interests. Of course it is a game or entertainment but also a sport or a competition. Then it is a science, a quest for the truth. But it is also an art where creativity and aesthetics play an important role. Here the question arises, what is aesthetic in chess? My brief answer, everything what is good and therefore obeys the laws of chess, as this is what art is about the manifestation and objectification of abstract natural principles. As we are natural beings, everything which is pure, undistorted and in line with nature resonates in us and creates a feeling of harmony and well-being. My final question would be, what is extraordinary aesthetic in chess? Answer, sublime harmony. Or in other words, moves which on the surface violate the laws of chess, but celebrate them on a higher level. This is how artists compose their creations. First, there has to be some kind of tension or dissonance caused by rule breaking of some sorts. When the tension finally gets released or a misconception explained, the aesthetic pleasure is immense as the distance from negative to positive is bigger than from neutral to positive. In chess, there are all kinds of special moves and tricks which are easily overlooked in games and pleasant to look at when presented. One of these moves is a fantastic bishop h6 trick. Before we go into the game, let me just comment on this encounter. This game was played in 1974 at the US Championship. Walter Brown managed to obtain the title of US Champion six times. This was only surpassed by Bobby Fischer and Samuel Reshevsky. Actually, I played Walter Brown in the 90s. So he is kind of a chess legend and this game is uh, very known in chess literature. Maybe you have come across it before, but even then I th think my explanations add some more value to it. e5, knight f3, knight f6. This is a Petrov defense. Very solid opening for black. White plays the main line, takes the pawn. I don't go too deep into <clears throat> the um, opening intricacies here because this is not an opening video, as I mentioned before. Knight e4, d45, we are still following the main line. White has some initiative in this symmetrical pawn structure. Of course, the symmetry um, gives a lot of solidity to black's position and such lines have a tendency to end in a drawer. But due to the extra move, white has some chances to create imbalances. Actually, this will happen in the game. Bishop e7, uh, black can also play knight c6 first and bishop e7, that's just a transposition of moves. Then there's also the line bishop to d6. But bishop e7 or knight c6 followed by bishop e7 is considered the main line. Castles, knight c6, c4. And here you see that white is creating um, a complicated pawn structure. There's an isolated pawn on d4 
emerging. This pawn here is now a potential isolated pawn because there might be a, an exchange of the c4 pawn versus d5 pawn. Knight b4 attacking the bishop. Black wants to stabilize uh, the square d5, which is uh, the neuralgic point in every IQP position. This the square in front of the isol isolated pawn. So in this case, the square d5 is of utmost importance. So if white now retreats the bishop to e2, black has uh, stabilized this square a bit and also driven the bishop back to a more passive square. The move bishop e2 actually is the main line and is what I would recommend to every white player here. But in this game, um, white played a sharper move, c takes d5. This approach was also followed by me in a game against uh, Yusupov in uh, 1992 in the German Bundesliga. c takes d5 is very ambitious, but uh, the engines indicate that it is inferior to bishop e2. Knight d3, securing the bishop pair, of course. Queen to d5, rook e1. White abandoned his bishop pair, but of course has a lot of initiative going for him. You see the knight on e4 is hanging. And behind the knight there is the bishop on e7 and the king. So black has to solve some problems along the e-file. Bishop f5, the knight has to be protected. And in, I show you what happened in my game with Yusupov. So this game saw the move knight c3, but before we uh, continue with this game, let me just show you what I played against Yusupov. It was a move knight to e5. This move was popular for a while in order to improve on the move knight c3 from this game here. But as the engines now helped to find out, it is not really um, apt to create any kind of problems for black. Yusupov castled, um, I played queen f3, he played g6, and in this position I played the most frequent move here, the move g4, and you see the, com the position is extremely complicated. By then, when we played this game, it was 1992, the engines were far less strong, and it was very difficult to really um, find out what was going on in this position. Now Yusupov played bishop h4 with an unclear position. Nowadays everybody knows uh, that bishop b4 can be considered as a refutation of white's setup. So I don't want to show this line because we want to keep this video as um, short as possible. This uh, it makes the whole approach very unappetizing for white. I have a line that goes down 10 moves deeper, but um, this is not about the opening, as I mentioned before. Actually, in this position, the best white can do is to play knight c3 instead of g4, which I played against Yusupov. Knight takes knight, b takes c3, Queen takes f3 and now g takes f3, leaving the knight on e5, leaving the pawn f7 under attack and after bishop e6, white can take on f7 with equality. But of course, equality is not very attractive in a theoretical sense. Coming back to the position after bishop f5, we just found out that the move knight e5, which was um, meant to be an improvement of knight c3, couldn't really do the job. 
Now we see the traditional knight c3 played by Walter Brown in the year 1974. Knight takes c3, forced. Now the queen is under attack, so the queen has to recapture the knight. This position is very interesting from a, let's say, philosoph philosophical or strategical point of view, because here we see the clash of two principles. Black has a static advantage due to the bishop pair, which belongs to the realm of material. So it's a slight material advantage Black has here. And Black also has the um, superior pawn structure. So if Black now can consolidate his position and um, manage to castle with his king into safety, Black would be better. White, on the other hand, has a dynamic advantage. White is better developed and black still has to solve the problem uh, with his king in the e-file, so white has a lot of pressure. This matchup, dynamic advantage very, uh, versus static advantage, you find in many, many openings. And actually strong players choose their openings according to their preferences. Some people prefer have to have static advantage, so something substantial in their hands, and then they have to defend to uh, um, reap uh, the rewards later, maybe in the end game. More dynamic players sometimes have the preference to go for their dynamic advantage in order to attack uh, the opponent. The strategy um, of the position really is a function of this structure, this advantage structure I just depicted. Of course, a dynamic player has the burden of proof on his shoulders. He has to prove that he has something to show for the static disadvantage of his position. And very often there is only a small window of opportunity for him to prove that. The other player, the static player, he needs to defend, he needs to consolidate his position, either by finishing his development, um, protecting weaknesses, dissolving weaknesses, or exchanging material, thus reducing the dynamic potential of his opponent. This tension field of static dynamics is really interesting and one of the core of chess strategy. So we see it unfo unfolding here in, in this game. Now, what can black do? Black can, the c7 pawn is under attack, obviously, should he play c6, which happened in the game, or should he sacrifice a pawn? This game actually showed how white can refute the move c6. So let's now have a look at the alternative. After this game, people found out that this pawn c7 cannot be maintained. So bishop e6 is the right move here. After queen takes c7, bishop d6, queen c2, castles, bishop d2, bishop f5, we see a position which happened in 10 games or so. For instance, in the game Robert Hübner against Vasily Smyslov uh, candidate matches in Felden 1983. Actually, all, I think, nine games of this position here ended in a draw. This position is equal. White has a material advantage but suffers uh, from a bad bishop and a weak isolated pawn. While black is enjoying the two bishops and also the superiority on the light squares. And of course he also enjoys uh, white having this weak pawn on d4 and this bad bishop. 
So this is the reason why the whole line, let's just quickly jump back. The whole line uh, c takes d5 opposed to bishop e2 has fallen into some kind of, uh, how do I say, neglect or disgrace. So bishop e2 is a move, but let's now jump back to the position after queen c3. Before this game, people still thought that they could get away with conserving the c pawn by playing c6 instead of sacrificing it like uh, Smyslov did against Hübner. Now, Black's idea is to play bishop e6, sealing the e-file, castling and claiming a substantial advantage. That's Black's winning plan. White has to do something quick. As I mentioned before, the window of opportunity is clothing for him. And if you want to find the solution, you can press on stop here. Otherwise, I will now will tell the move. It is our topical move, bishop h6 exclamation mark. The famous bishop h6 trick. Of course, this move is violating some rules as it leaves the bishop hanging there. I mean, one of the most important rules in chess is not to <laughs> blunder material. Respect your material. And this is, of course, a violation. In the games you play, or in general, there are many opportunities, more than you might think, to put pieces on protected squares. This is the kind of move which is one of the most difficult to spot and it's one of the most easy to be overlooked moves because we don't tend to place our pieces on such dangerous squares. But sometimes there are opportunities to do just this and of course this is highly aesthetic if it works. I was compared like uh, those with people who are able to walk uh, bare feet uh, on a hot or glowing coal. So like uh, Indian uh, gu uh, fa uh, yoga masters or uh, fakirs are, are doing it, right? So pieces walking over glowing coals. That is something very spectacular. But now let's uh, dive into this move. So white cannot play normal moves because black just would um, complete its plan. Bishop e6 castling. This move um, prevents the move bishop e6 by attacking the pawn g7. At the same time the queen's rook is incorporated, so uh, this, the rook is now liberated, the bishop was blocking it on c1, now the rook can participate, and white has ambitions in the e-file, white wants the double rooks, and this is made possible now. This is the strategic and logical explanation of this move, bishop h6, but now we have to find out whether it really works. In the game, black played a rook to g8, defending the pawn. Let's first have a look at what happens if black takes the bishop. The critical move, of course. Rook e5, the queen has to go back to d7. Rook e1, of course, play is pretty forced now and has to be. Uh, bishop e6, sealing the e-file, but now comes the point of the bishop h6 idea. By playing d5, the diagonal, the long diagonal is opened and the power of the queen is revealed on that diagonal. So if black now recaptures the pawn, white is able to play rook takes e6, winning, because we have an attack on the rook h8. After d5, uh, the better move is just to castle away, um, protecting this rook here. 
on h8. So white now takes the bishop and after f takes e6, rook e6, white was clearly better. For instance, in the game uh, Baird against Dutreuf, uh, Belgium to Southend, you see white has a better pawn structure. These uh, doubled pawns here are, are weak. And of course, white has also active rooks uh, in the e-file. What else is possible after uh, bishop h6? There's also the move bishop e4, clothing the e-file. But now white can really take the pawn. Black is hoping um, that there is some some activity, some problems now going on in the G file. You see there are energy beams converging on the square G2. Um, maybe, so if white moves the bishop away, yeah, bishop takes F3, uh, would win the knight as a G2 pawn would be pinned, right? But white can play rook takes E4. Queen takes e4, and now the best move is rook e1, queen g6. Of course, the bishop cannot move because of mate on g2. Queen b4, attacking the bishop, threatening checkmate himself, the white player. Queen takes e7, so castling only move. Rook e7, threatening checkmate on b7 b6 and now queen c4. Now white is winning because black cannot take the bishop. Amongst others there is a, amongst others there is a threat of queen takes f7. Pardon me, this was a bit uh, dirtily drawn here. Queen takes f7 is one of the ideas after which white would um, uh, maintain his um, material advantage, so rook takes g7, but now we have a checkmate. Okay, so the whole line doesn't work for black. That leaves us with the move of the game, rook to g8, protecting the g7 pawn. Rook e5, queen d7, and now white is uh, reaping uh, is reaping the reward of the move bishop h6 by clearing the first rank. White now was able to connect the rooks very efficiently down the e-file, but still black's position appears to hold. So black is sealing the e-file once more, but white doesn't let loose here. Because if you are attacking, you you uh, have to follow through with with your full might, right? Knight g5, attacking the bishop e6. In the game, we saw black castling queenside. Let's have a look at the alternative, which is of course bishop takes knight. Bishop takes knight, and now we see white is. Having the initiative as black cannot castling, uh, cannot castle queenside, and also cannot castle kingside anymore. But black is hoping to um, establish a blockade on the light squares because we have the strong bishop on e6, and the square d5 also is under control. So, how is white breaking through? Maybe black has a fortress. This is the question now, but there is also a clear answer to this question. There is no fortress. White uh, will be able to crack it. g5, bishop g3, king f8. So the idea is clear. Play the rook to d8, the rook to g6, and then the king has quite a safe square on g8. So this is castling by hand. But now white can exploit black's lack of development and the problematic location of his king. D5 exclamation mark. 
The pawn d4 was useless and now it is sacrificed in order to clear the long diagonal again. The queen uh, is now activated. So let's uh, say black takes back with a pawn. C takes d5. Now there is a very quick win. Rook takes e6, f e6, queen f6. After king a, um, after king e8, rook takes e6, of course. So queen f7, check. And now um, white is winning very quickly. Black is losing the queen, and then there is still an attack going on. After d5, the only move is bishop takes d5. So there is no rook sacrifice on e6 possible anymore. But now it's a very, very strong move, a silent, a modest move, rook, the rook drops back to e3, opening uh, two diagonals, the bishop diagonal, as you can see, and the queen's diagonal. The idea is to play queen f6 followed by bishop d6 check, or queen takes h6 for that matter. What can black do here? He can, for instance, play bishop e6, but then the same happens as just before. This exchange sack on e6, um, annihilation of defense. And now white is again winning the queen after king e8, for instance, rook takes e6. That's not working for black. In the game, black played the superior uh, queenside castling. So bishop g5 was not very convincing as we just saw. Queenside castling happened in the game and now white is not taking on e6 as you might think he would have done. No, he's taking on f7 which is much stronger. Knight takes f7 unrooting the bishop on e6 and of course we have some soft spots here in the e-file. The knight has to be taken as there's also an attack against the rook in place, not only against the bishop. So the knight has to be taken. Rook takes e7 and that's a nice sight from white's perspective, a rook on the seventh rank. Queen takes d4. But yes, black is still quite alive and kicking because he wants to exchange queens. The bishop on h6 is still hanging, so there's still hope. But white has now a good opportunity to um, transfer the game into a superior and actually one rook ending. Queen takes queen, pawn takes queen, Pawn takes bishop. So we have a double rook ending. We can observe there is some problems here. There are some problems in black position. These doubled h pawns here are problematic. And of course the active rook on f7 is another problem. But white has, and this keeps black kind of in the game, at least for a couple of more moves, white of course is vulnerable at the, on the first uh, rank. Rook b1 attacking the b7 pawn. Rook to g5. h4. So let's let's see what white can do apart from that. White could of course also have taken the b7 pawn like this, not with the other rook because of checkmate only one. Um, but I guess now, I'm just improvising now because I don't have this in my script. I think there must be quite an easy answer. I guess that it is a move like rook b5. Interrupting uh, the connection between the rooks, of course you cannot move this rook away from the first rank because there would be this checkmate on d1. So maybe this is forced now and now the black position could be quite okay because black has an active rook here on the d-file. 
So white played a better move. White played after rook g5 the move h4, which is giving air to the king. Rook b5, rook b5, cb5, and now rook takes h7. As it turns out, this rook ending, rook ending is hopeless for black. The game continued. Rook d1 check, king h2, rook d2. Black wants to grab some pawns and maybe um, try to run down the board with his a pawn. Rook h6, rook a2, h5. White is quicker, as you can see. Rook takes f2, check, king c7, h6. And now, if black would run with a pawn with a5, h7, of course, there is the immediate threat of rook a8. But after rook f7, we can just sacrifice the rook here as white with rook c8, queening. That doesn't work. So black resorted after the move h6 to king b6. It's important that white is not able to remove his rook from the h-file with a check, as we just saw. That's why the move king b6. King h3, white wants to get the g-pawn going. a5, this pawn is black's last hope. g4, b4, cb, ab, rook e8. But the problem black has here is white has two connected past pawns. Rook f1 trying to pick up the h-pawn from behind. Rook h1 is a threat now. That's why white played king g2. Rook f7, g5. These connectors are deadly. Rook f5 trying to grab this g5-pawn with check. But that is not a problem for white. White can just uh, try to queen his h-pawn. Check. King f3. And in this position, black resigned because white has no problems of holding the b-pawn, of course. If you like that game, um, subscribe to my channel, stay tuned. I have a huge collection of bishop h6 trick games. They're beautiful to look at. And in every game, we see some interesting strategic concepts uh, in play. Okay, see you later then. Bye-bye. Have a good day.